Think of a board game, any of the classics. What's in it? As in, what parts are there to the game? Most games are going to include a board, dice, and cards. Monopoly uses cards to track property ownership as well as chance and community chest cards. Settlers of Catan uses cards to track players' resources. Clue uses its cards in a way to hide information. Pandemic, as well as other co-op board games, use cards for nearly anything, like character sheets, random events, and even deciding what the enemy does. Even if we stray from board games, cards are often used to represent more abstract or unrealistic things. A good example of this would be Magic the Gathering, which mainly focuses on fantasy. Some of their cards are pretty straightforward. For example, Fencing Ace. Yeah, it's a guy who's good at fencing. Good. The Raven Man. It's a guy. Another guy. He has ravens. He's cool. Pursued Whale. A big Whale. It comes with its own Ahab. Perfect. But Magic also has some more complex things. Like, I don't know what a sublime epiphany would look like. I don't know what it would do, but I think this is pretty close. And I don't know why I would care about the approach of the second son, but putting the words win the game means something. Inquisition of Kozilect? I don't know who Kozilect is, and before this card I didn't know what Inquisition really meant. However, I don't think I want to meet or be a part of anything dealing with this card. Trading card games aren't the only time cards can have complex meanings. Tarot cards are basically just a deck of playing cards that we've attached meaning to. And really sweet art. Like, here, look at this. The Hermit card is number 9 in the Major Arcana, specifically from the Rider Waite deck. What does it mean? I, I, I don't know. He's alone. Loneliness. Uh, maybe he's a guide. He's got a lantern. He could be guiding people. Uh, long robes could mean he's wise. There's a lot of speculation when it comes to tarot card meanings. But if we turn our attention to part two, video games, I can tell you exactly what this card means. And it means I'm rich. Now, this is Baltro. And it's about poker hands, it has tarot cards in it, and other cards. Uh, only the demo's out right now, and I can't wait for it to release, but uh, anyway. Video games will often use cards as their main pieces. I mean, you've got a whole genre of roguelite deck builders, like Slay the Spire, Grifflands, Cobalt Core. Uh, you've got the online trading card games, Hearthstone, Magic Arena. Uh, you've even got cards showing up in non-card genres. Friends vs. Friends and Back for Blood are both first-person shooters. Tower Tactics is a tower defense game. And Loop Hero... I don't know how to describe Loop Hero. So, clearly cards are a significant part of video games. But why are we still using cards? Unlike the physical games, where having a deck allows them to create randomness, video games don't need it. Also, cards don't need to carry the representation that their physical games need to. If I cast Fireball in a match of Hearthstone, I get to watch the actual ball of fire get thrown at the enemy. There's less need for cards to even have art on them, and that's the best part of a card. In addition, physical cards can have some serious monetary value. I have a few historic brawl decks on Magic Arena, and I've never spent a dollar on it. However, dropping the deck list into a website like Archidect, we can see that it would cost me about $420. Yeah, no. Uh, cards having price tags can be a downside when building decks, but it makes opening packs all the more thrilling. So why do video games still use cards? Part 3. Cards are intuitive. If you showed a person unfamiliar with video games this screen, would they know how to play? As someone who's tried to get non-video game playing people into video games, games that involve any amount of keybinds are difficult. When they need to place their offhand on WASD, their other hand on the mouse, and then needing to know keys like the sprint key, the crouch key, the inventory key, the jump key, and anything else that comes with the game, it's rough. Just moving and looking around in a 3D space is tough for people who aren't used to it. On the other hand, how do you play this game? 
Card games always have the most important part of the game front and center, or bottom center. Everything you can do as a player sits in this general area of the screen. There aren't any mysterious keys hiding new menus or crafting recipes that make new things. The cards you have in your hand is the list of things you can do. And don't get me started on how simple it is to play cards. Simply dragging the cards you want to play to the target is the most intuitive it could get. Now, don't get me wrong. Card games can be complex. Not everything you do comes from your cards. Slay the Spire has potions, Cobalt Core lets you move your ship, Library of Runa has ego and abnormality pages. However, the fact that card games have stuck to most of the focus on the cards makes it easy to follow. Some card games take this point to the next level. Magic the Gathering has plenty of cards that let you cast them from graveyards, or anywhere that isn't your hand, really. Uh, however, on Magic Arena, these cards appear next to your actual hand, letting you just focus on your hand. Part 4. Cards Carry Rules When a game uses cards for their method of interaction, the question is what do cards do? I mean, look here, look at this. Cool, great, the card is called Strike, it's one mana, it's an attack. But how am I supposed to know what Strike does? It's a huge mystery. I'll never know until I play it, and even though what if it changes, it's impossible to know. Oh, six damage. They say in Magic the Gathering that reading the card explains the card, and that's exactly it. While you might not know how powerful any given card is, I should be able to show you any card from any game and you would have a general idea of what that card does. Sometimes this gets a little muddied with keywords, but since we're talking video games, the keyword meaning show up next to the card. But even with keywords, any player would have a better idea of what a card does compared to looking at a cluttered hotbar of ability icons. This screenshot was provided by Cascadian Falls and shows his setup. I don't know what any of these buttons do, and the time it would take to hover over each of them to figure out what any of them do would take a while. Alternatively, if you saw an enemy doing an animation you've never seen before, you have no idea what they're doing, and so you have no idea how to play around it. Does it deal damage? Does it stun you? Is it a movement tool? Who knows? Until you're dead, and then you have time to read the paragraphs of description. Compare these to someone countering my spell in Magic Arena, and you can see why having rules text on the cards means so much. Part 5. Cards have implications. Whenever a game uses cards, there are a few expectations that comes with it. For one, the order of your cards will be randomized. Now, this aspect can be seen in any number of card games, from roguelike deck builders to trading card games, but a more interesting version of this expectation shows up in Back for Blood. Back for Blood is Left for Dead, except for a few little things, and if you don't know Left for Dead, both of them are four-person co-op games about shooting zombies. Uh, my favorite part of Back for Blood is that it lets you create a deck of perk cards, changing up how you play the game. You could specialize in healing, explosives, generating money, maybe you like going down, or maybe outrunning all the zombies and all of your teammates. Currently, when you start a campaign, everyone gets to start with their full perk deck. This isn't random. However, in each level, you can find a small box, or if you're lucky, even a few small boxes, and this box has a random perk card, letting you purchase a card you didn't bring with you for the rest of the run. The next expectation is that cards will have good synergies with other cards. The whole experience of card games is about finding synergies to break the game. A great example of this would be in Cobalt Core. In the last act of the game, you can find a merchant who offers you a selection of useless cards. For example, Lightning in a Bottle spends 3 mana to get 3 mana back, Waltz moves your ship to the left 2 spaces and then moves it back, Bruise makes you take 1 damage and then heal 1 damage, Buckshot lets you make 3 attacks, each of them dealing 0 
damage. So while these cards may be useless by themselves, you can actually get a lot more out of them. Escalate increases the damage of your attacks, making Buckshot actually deal damage. Admin Deploy lets you play a card for free, making Lightning in a Bottle actually give you mana. I would keep going, but the wiki for Cobalt Core sucks, so I'm gonna move on, but you get the point. The last expectation is that cards are meant to be collected, and card games will have you get more cards. In the roguelike deck builder genre, you'll get to pick a new card after, like, every single battle, and sometimes even more often than that. Other card games, like Friends vs. Friends, or your traditional trading card games, will have you grinding out currency just so you can purchase one more pack. J just one more pack. I mean, why, why shouldn't I open another one? I I, you know, I, I could do just like just one more pack, man. When a developer uses cards, they don't need to explain any of these things to the player. It's expected, and it's more surprising when a game doesn't follow these trends. So, with all that said, part six, cards are simple. There's something to be said about how simple a card really is. I mean, so many games have the same formula on how a card should look. It's a struggle to break the formula of the card name at the top, the art directly below that, the rules text towards the bottom, and it's not like you need to change the format of the card. You could make a few changes, like moving the name or putting the stats on top of the card. With the same general format of cards, the entire field of card games feels like home to me and many people are inspired to make cards themselves. I've tried my own hand on making physical card games as well as my unfinished video game, but hey, I feel like I could just make cool cards like the devs do, and I'm not the only one. Many people make custom cards all the time, and I mean, you've got mods adding in new cards to games, uh, subreddits filled with custom cards for their own games that actually, you know what? Let's go take a look. Mechanical Elemental Ascendant is a master class in what a card can be. Not only is it a creature, a artifact, an enchantment. Hey guys, uh, Pan Gaming here, you know, from the, from, from the video. After doing Omega Strikers montages for a while, I wanted to try uh, something a completely different than what I usually do, and uh, this is what happened. A bit of an informational video about one of my favorite genres, uh, card games, if you didn't notice. Uh, this video has taken a few weeks of thought, and I, mean, I started putting it together before the uh, So This Is It, Huh? video. So. It took a while, like a whole week to write the script and even just to collect the game footage. So um, if you like the video and this is something you want to see more of, leave a comment. I do read every comment that gets posted on anywhere on my channel, and it's the easiest way to see if this is what people really want to see. So if this is something I should make, let me know. Uh, anyway, since uh, this is taking up a ton of my time recently. I'm, I'm gonna go play one of my other favorite genres, uh, that being games that make you sad. Uh, I just bought this one. It seems like it's really gonna fit the genre, so pretty excited for that. Oh, and um, if you're new here, hey, welcome. Uh, all of my other content isn't this video, so you have to wait and see if I do more. So, um, yeah, no, that, that's that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm out of here. See ya! God, we...